the four men who want to be Columbus mayor. From the Battelle studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, the four candidates for Columbus mayor. Terry Boyd, former Columbus School Board President, Andrew Ginther, Columbus City Council President, James Raglan, community activist, and Zach Scott, Franklin County Sheriff. For the first time in 16 years, Michael Coleman will not be mayor of Columbus. One of these four men will be. They are running in next month's nonpartisan primary. The top two vote getters, regardless of party, will face each other in November. Coleman's departure will leave a long shadow, but it also provides the city with a chance for different thinking, some new policies perhaps. And even if you don't live in the city of Columbus, its policies, the city's policies, have a ripple effect throughout central Ohio. Thank you all for coming to this special Columbus on the Record. We'll, we'll get to the in-depth of some of the city issues and the big issues facing the city in a moment, but let's start off real quick, Terry, with one question. What's the one thing, or could pick one thing, pick one thing that Mayor Coleman has done, is doing, that you would keep as mayor? I think he's done a, a good job in um, having um, collaboration between uh, public and private um, projects. Um, that's something that I believe in and probably would continue to do. Andy Ginther, what's one thing that he's doing? You say, I'm not messing with that, it's working. Well, I think we've, uh, you know, hit our strides with uh, early childhood education and our focus on the earliest years of life. So the early Start Columbus that we started together, uh, I would continue to grow and expand uh, throughout our city. James? Uh, I think the expansion of downtown and, and what's happened down there uh, should be allowed to continue, in my opinion. I think we've reached a point where the private sector will continue to sustain and, and grow that area, and so uh, I, I'd like to see that continue. Zach Scott. I, I think downtown has been very successful. Um, I think well, we have a lot of people that's moving in. There's a lot of dynamics going on down there. Uh, but uh, probably would take a little different approach as how we affect that and make that continue to grow. But I think as far as uh, if you had to pinpoint one area that was somewhat successful, I'd say downtown. We'll start with you on that. What is, the one, what is one thing that you would do completely different than, what, than the way the mayor is doing it right now? I, I think what I would probably look at uh, is making sure that we're getting better negotiating deals when it comes to downtown development. Uh, there's, a, there's a variety of things, but if we're talking about the one thing, uh, my, my four areas is going to be like neighborhoods and jobs and education and safety. So that's kind of the platform that I'm focusing on. I can't, I can't tell you that I'm just going to pick one area that I'm going to work on because those four areas that I just mentioned are very interconnected. They affect each other, and when one starts to drag down, it pulls the other ones down. So those are the four areas that I'll be focused on. We need a balanced approach. We'll get to some of those in a minute. James, what's a thing you would do a 180 on that the Mayor Coleman is doing now? The impact of the lives of our residents from city government. I, I really do think that we need to uh, reestablish a, a presence in the lives of the folks that live in our neighborhoods. And uh, we've done a really good job in some targeted areas of excellence, but I really do think that there are some areas that have been chronically underserved under this administration, and that'd be uh, job number one for me. Andrew Ginther, what, was, what would be a thing that you would disagree with the mayor is doing now and you'd change? I think we can do a lot better around shared services, uh, particularly with our townships and suburban uh, neighbors. I think there's a whole lot more we can do around delivering high quality services that the public deserves and expects, but doing it more collaboratively. We've started doing some of those things, but I think there's great room for improvement around collaboration and realizing savings, efficiency, but still delivering high quality services to the public. Terry Boyd? I think applying uh, critical thinking. Uh, there's been a lack of that, uh, a lack of long-term planning, uh, the vision, even in downtown. Uh, just think, all of the residents of, uh, of downtown, wouldn't it be great to still have the city center where you would have a, a grocery store in there, you would have other types of uh, shopping in there. You could even have a club or two where people could walk to who live in downtown to go to socialize uh, and, and, and do other things recreationally. And so it's a lack of long-term planning, a lack of critical thinking applied, not only downtown, but in our neighborhoods. And so as you mentioned, we'll get to some of those subjects and I yeah. can't wait. Um, you know, the, 
the first thing people talk about when they're when they go into the, the voting booth is or what they when they open their paycheck when they see that property tax bill is their taxes um, many feel especially folks who live in the more popular neighborhoods like Clintonville or the short north of Victorian Village or German Village many feel the taxes overall taxes are too high we have the highest income tax rate in the state at two and a half percent Andrew Ginther are we getting a good return in services for that investment in taxes? Well, uh, you don't need to necessarily take my word for it. You take a look at all of the third-party uh, validators and support that have recognized uh, Columbus is uh, the fastest growing economy in the Midwest, a AAA bond rating from all three rating agencies, lowest unemployment in decades. Uh, so I think that uh, there's been a great return on investment and in continuing to restore over time, not overnight. That's the commitment we made uh, to the voters back in 2009, that we would ask them for more to invest in the city's future, but we'd reform city government. We'd ask our employees to pay more towards uh, their retirement and towards their health care to match up with other public entities. We said we'd make an unprecedented investment and in commitment to economic development. We've realized great gains, obviously, with the partnership around Columbus 2020. But we also said we'd restore the Rainy Day Fund. And we are ahead of schedule to have a $75 million balance in the Rainy Day Fund uh, by 2017. So uh, I think there's been a great return on investment. We've opened up all the rec centers uh, that were closed before uh, uh, issue one in 2009, and we've added curbside recycling, which has been a very popular and uh, very much in demand service James, across the city. What do you think about the current level of income tax in particular? That's the one that the city council has the most uh, control sure. over. I, I think your question was really on the return on investment. And uh, if you really look at where we are right now, uh, we've seen some areas that have seen some return, but there are other areas that really have not seen. And, you know, I'd ask voters to look outside your front window. Uh, and if uh, outside your front window your neighborhood looks a lot better than it has in the last 10 years, then maybe Andy's right. But uh, I think there are plenty of neighborhoods around central Ohio, around Columbus, uh, that have not seen that area of return. I think we've got the third highest tax burden of any city, major city in the United States. If you don't believe me, just Google it. And, uh, you know, I'm wondering if the Hilltop sees the return on its investment. I'm wondering if Linden receives that return on its investment. You some, know, so. some, the City Hall and the, the County Auditor dispute that, but that's one economist's view is that we are high, but others say we're not quite as high as far as that, that well, agency Google out of Washington. It. Google yeah. it. I think they yeah. should, they should look and, and see for themselves uh, exactly uh, what that statistic really is. Zach Scott, would you support perish the thought, lowering the city income tax? Well, first of all, I need to look and see what we're actually, our priorities. We did a, 2009, we increased our, in, our income taxes. And that generated around $85 million or so. Uh, so I think the first thing we need to start looking at priorities, where we're spending our money all the time. Unfortunately, we spent a lot of money uh, bailing out some uh, large corporations. Uh, we spend money for a lot of tax abatements. Uh, I know there's, there's the arguments on both sides saying, oh, well, that's generating more income. But unfortunately, um, I don't see that it's in generating that much more income. I, I have not seen that. So I think it's a shift of priorities before we, you know, the problem is we, we, we bail out corporations, then we ask for zoo levies and school levies. We ask for increase when we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing, and then going to the taxpayers and saying, we need some more of your money. Well, should we not look to make sure we're taking care of the dollars that we have if they're actually doing the priorities, what the citizens' priorities are? So before we go start looking for more tax increases, let's look at our priorities, make sure they're shifted to the people's priorities that we actually serve before we look at ever raising any taxes. Terry Boyd, tax I, burden I, on this city. Yeah, I think there's some... Um, I think that there are some things we can do to save uh, taxpayers money, and I would be for uh, rolling back some of that uh, income tax. You know, when we passed that income tax in 2009, it was a very sensitive reason for doing so. We uh, were under the impression that uh, fire service would in improve, police services, there would be more police uh, on the street. That really didn't occur, uh, and so that money went in different directions. Um, you know, Columbus really doesn't have a revenue problem, it has a spending problem. And I think that we need to reprioritize how we uh, spend those dollars. Again, some of our neighborhoods, they look like war zones. And so I know that those folks do not think they've gotten a return on their taxes. And these have been some of the most loyal uh, and, and I guess committed uh, taxpayers in our city. Yet, they get recreation centers. 
uh, but they don't get um, revitalized neighborhoods. Uh, their their sidewalks are, are poor. There's blight everywhere. Okay, Andy Ginther, as president of City Council, you're you're a policymaker in this in this realm. Give you a chance to respond. You mentioned that since 2009, you've reformed city government. Address Mr. Boyd's concern, and also how have how have what reforms has really happened? Well, a couple of them. Uh, we committed uh, through the collective bargaining process that we believe in and believe uh, works in the city of Columbus. Uh, we said that we would realize $100 million worth of savings by the end of the decade by working through the collective bargaining process, asking our employees to pitch in more towards their health care, towards their retirement, uh, streamlining some of our processes as a city. Uh, we're on track now to realize savings in excess of $144 million by the end of the decade by working with our employees. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, unique, but a lot of people don't realize how much you can learn by working with your employees who are doing the job every day on behalf of the public on how they could be doing their job more effectively and more efficiently. Uh, and so we've done that, and uh, we've made reforms across the city, both within, you know, some of our larger, larger budget uh, areas. You know, over 70 percent of the city's budget is devoted to public safety. Uh, so we've continued to put more police officers and firefighters on the street since the voters chose uh, to invest in their future in 2009. Uh, and I think those results, people are seeing the results. We have some of the lowest crime rates. We're recognized as America's safest big city. Uh, and neighborhoods continue to improve. But not all of our neighborhoods are sharing in that success. And that's one of the reasons uh, why I'm running for mayor, is to make sure that neighborhoods throughout our city are all able uh, to be part of the Columbus success story. Zach Scott, I want to get to the, the downtown tax abatements. Now, the mayor, Coleman, instituted basically a, uh, basically forgave new property taxes on new development in downtown as a way to boost downtown housing. And downtown housing has really come a long way in the past 10 to 12 years. And you could argue that may not have happened without the property tax incentives because people, it's really expensive to build downtown. Hasn't it been useful? Hasn't, hasn't it been a good thing? Um, I don't have a problem with tax incentives as long as they're producing long-term jobs. I, I don't have a problem with that. I'm just saying that we need to negotiate it better. When uh, you have situations where you know parking lots getting sold for a dollar, okay, that's not good negotiations, and that did happen. So I'm not saying that it's all bad. I'm saying you have to be able to have someone to come to the table and negotiate better for our taxpayers' dollars. W again, it's kind of ironic that we say we're we're saving all this money for these taxpayers because we're going to bring in this business, but then we turn around and ask to bring new levies. That doesn't make sense. There's something wrong. Why do we need to bring in these new levies if this thing is working so well? And if and if, if it's a location where people really want to come, do we need to give that much tax incentive, that kind of abatements? Because companies know, if I can make money in this location, I'm going to come to this location. So that's kind of like... Uh, we, we see a new apartment building proposed or being built in downtown Columbus almost every week. Is it time to say, okay, you know what, the market's taking care of itself now, no more tax abatements? Yes, I started off saying that. I think the private sector is now uh, in a place where they can, you know, make get a return on their investment and continue to sustain that. And that doesn't mean that we're going to give up on uh, having quality services for downtown residents. They're still going to get their garbage picked up. They're still going to get their streets swept. They're still going to get the level of excellence that they, that they are due based off of where they live. However, uh, we should be reinvesting in some of those areas of town that don't look like downtown. And we haven't been doing it in the past. It hasn't been popular to do that, and it's much harder, but we've got to get started. And again, so the City Council extended the original tax abatements uh, last year, I believe. Why not let those run out and, and put the money into the new developments? Our work downtown has been a huge success, and uh, with the number of residents that are moving downtown, and if you look at any of the research out there on growth and development trends, for the first time in 60 years, people want to live closer to where they work. Uh, downtown Columbus is the economic engine, not just for this city, but for the region. But for the folks who got in on the ground floor, enjoyed the benefits for 10 years, shouldn't they now have to pay the full freight of their property taxes? By extending that tax break, we make sure that folks stay in their homes and are committed to downtown's revitalization and continue to get more folks living downtown. I mean, the, the bottom line is we, only, we still are under our 10,000 unit goal uh, for downtown uh, housing. And quite honestly, successful downtowns, thriving downtowns across this country, which we seek to become part of, have two, three, five times as many residents living in downtown Columbus. The first grocery store in downtown Columbus in 60 years 
opened in the Hills Market just right over at, at, at Gay and Grant. And that is because of our commitment to downtown revitalization. I want to move away from downtown and get to education. In the recent days, in the past week or so, the campaign has, has taken a harsh turn. Uh, Zach Scott, you've bought billboards, you've sent out flyers, mm -hmm. uh, blaming <coughs> Andrew Ginther for the data rigging scandal in the Columbus City Schools. Uh, Andy Ginther, the ads refer to your time on the school board in which you were chair of the Oversight Committee. Um, during the time that these, the, the first rumblings of something going on improper with the data at the schools surfaced, could you have done more, should you have done more as, a, as chair of the Oversight Committee to investigate these claims? Well, I'm really proud of my record on the Board of Education, and I responded immediately to these anonymous tips when uh, they came uh, into my office. We responded immediately. We had staff uh, follow up with those folks. And the other important part here to remember is that I continued an investigation. When other district administrators wanted it shut down, and there are plenty of public records and documents out there supporting the fact that I told the interim internal auditor to carry on the investigation, and I'm the only former board member that worked with the auditor of state's office to help untangle this mess uh, that really put our city and our community uh, in harm's way. Well, the auditor's report says, though, that you told him or his investigators that you d these emails weren't specific enough, even though they used the terms cooking the books and the attendance data was suspicious. I mean, how it does that jive with what you just said? The audit, uh, the audit went on for years, and it went on. It was ongoing until I left the Board of Education and joined Columbus City Council in 2007. So over those number of years, we had an internal audit staff following up and researching uh, the, the allegations and determining things. What I'll remind folks is that the auditor state took tens of thousands of man hours to uncover and untangle this mess. And our internal audit staff, I stand behind them and what we charged them to do, working with the State Department of Education, working with other outside support to try to get to the bottom of it. Terry Boyd, you were on the school board at that time. That's right. Um, you supported the so-called policy governance, which was kind of a hands-off approach. Mm -hmm. Let the administration do the dirty work. You set the policy. Mm -hmm. Could you have done more? Should you have done more to oversee the data collection and analysis of the school board. Oh, school there's, no, there's no doubt we would have done more if we would have known. Um, the internal auditor was, was not directed to bring that to the full board. Um, Andy uh, did not bring it to the full board. So the full board was uh, not knowledgeable about that particular uh, aspect of the internal auditor's investigation. If it would have landed on the school board's table, uh, there's no doubt in my mind the school board would have, I, in fact, I know the school board would have taken uh, more action. At that time, uh, our, our president in 2004 was Karen Schwartzwalder. And I know Karen would have wanted to uh, dive deeper in that particular subject. In 2005, it was Stephanie Hightower. And I know Stephanie would have uh, taken it further. But the board relieved or put the, put the internal auditor who was starting to look into this on administrative leave and she eventually resigned. Right at the time this was coming to a head, why did that happen? Why did the school board do that? Well, now you're asking me to go back a number of years, Mike, to recall why she was released. It wasn't because of the, uh, the uh, data manipulation situation um, as far as I uh, am concerned. It was a, a lack of performance all the, all the way around. Uh, and, and so she was released. But, but when the new internal auditor came on board, again, um, he did not bring uh, that information uh, to the board. Zach so Scott, you're a, you've, you're a sheriff, mm -hmm. you've been a detective. Mm -hmm. You get tips all the time. You hand tips off to your <coughs> subordinates or to other officers. Can you see where this tip was handed off to somebody? How, res how responsible should Andy Ginther or Terry Boyd be for getting a tip? giving it to somebody else and then not being on the school folks don't follow up well, on it. Being on the school board is one thing. Being actually the chair of the audits committee, that's your job. It's about leadership. It's about, I have to dig into this thing and find out what in the world is going on. It's one thing to hand something off and rely upon other people. It's also to follow up and say, if, if this is going on, I need to know exactly where we are on this. Now, uh, working as a detective for years, that's what you do. Working as a supervisor, same thing you do. So I'm, being on the school board is one thing. Actually being, that's your job to follow up and be in audits when you're the chair to look over these types of situations what, and for eight year period. I would encourage everyone, read, read the auditor's report, the statement, or look at Paul Akers' interview with Mr. Ginther. 
Just follow up on it. It's very simple. It's just about leadership. James Ragland, going forward in school governance, um, there's been talk of a mayoral takeover of the, of the school district. Is that something you think should happen? No. Uh, I do believe that we should empower uh, the school board to do their job. Um, I think policy governance is a proven failure. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the board had to go through years and years of policy governance that really silenced the board members from speaking out. I think that was a byproduct of Bill Moss uh, telling board members week in and week out the truth that unfortunately the state auditor had to uncover. Uh, as far as this data scandal is, I continue to ask for an apology uh, from my colleagues here uh, for the role that they played in that data scandal. Unfortunately, uh, hundreds if not thousands of children were negatively impacted by the work that you guys did not do. And quite frankly, disproportionately, the majority of those students look like me. They graduate or they drop out from school ill-equipped to join our workforce, ill-equipped to live quality lives. And what happens is they go to Zach in the justice system. And that is the byproduct of the neighborhood decline that we see. It's the byproduct of the unemployment that we see. Well, and we need to do a better real job. Real quick, because I want to get to the big picture. Terry, uh, Terry do you have any regrets that you didn't do more? That you, and is we, an apology warranted? Any, anything that came to the board, we worked on. If it didn't come to the board, how is the board to know Andy? to work on it? Any reg regrets? If you could do it over again, would you do it differently? I feel very good about uh, what I did as a member of the Board of Education and chairing and leading the Audit and Accountability Committee with private sector leaders who were part of that committee, senior risk officer at Huntington Banks, CPA from Nationwide Insurance, controller at Ohio State, who helped to chair and lead that committee. And based on the information we had, we launched an immediate investigation. And when it was to be shut down by the administration, we ordered it on. We had them work with the Ohio Department of Education. That investigation and that audit, the student accountability audit, was still on the internal auditor's work plan. And in our minutes, mm -hmm. until I left the Board of Education, and I am the only former board member who worked with the Auditor State's Office to help uncover this and entangle this mess. We'll have to, we'll have to leave it there because I do want to get to public safety because that's a major concern of folks in the city. James Raglan, um, the relationship between police officers and people of color in other cities, more so than here, has been in the news lately. How would you describe the current relationship between our police division and the African American community or other minority communities in the city? Well, I think. Uh, the people are starting to speak out about what it is that they need. We convened a series of four uh, community engagement forums, uh, myself and Columbus Area Integrated Health Services, uh, actually the Sheriff's Office, Columbus Police Department, and Law Offices of Byron L. Potts, brought the community together to talk about the relationship between the community and the police department. And what we found, first and foremost, our community is demanding a community review board. They feel like the time has come for us to quit talking about it and put some action towards using the collective bargaining process to get a community review board here. We also... Oh, we got to get around the table. Ah, sure. Zach okay. Scott, you, you Sheriff, uh, is yeah. a community review board something this city needs, something you'd support? The, the problem is when you throw out the word community review, review board, you're talking about how is it picked, how is it selected, how is it funded, what authority does it have. It's, it's one thing to say, you know, we want to have a community review board, but there's a whole lot of dynamics go behind that. So at presently, I, I went to the same meetings. Uh, I've been very encouraged by the meetings because there's, there's usually five or six people who get up out of, say, of 100 people that do have some complaints, and it's about relationships that we need to continue to always work on. But about 95% of all the people that walk out of there are coming up to Columbus Police and shaking their hands and saying, I appreciate what you do every day. So sometimes I think as far as uh, we have in these difficult relationships that are, I think sometimes the media blows those up at times. But that's asking the choir if they like to sing. The folks that come to those meetings aren't, <laughs> aren't causing too many problems usually, no, right? They're not. They're, yeah. they're law-abiding citizens, yeah. but they're appreciating yeah. that law enforcement's yeah. in there. Andy so. Ginther, how would you describe, we haven't had a Ferguson situation here. We haven't had what happened in New York happen here to that degree. We've had incidents, but how would you describe the relationship between the police and, and the black community in particular here? Improving under the leadership of Chief Jacobs uh, with the commitment from the mayor and Chairman Klein and myself. Uh, you know, we're committed to hearing out 
And so we asked the chief to go out on a, on a listening tour to hear directly from folks in this community who haven't had the same experiences I've had with law enforcement. I grew up with a very different respect and, and, and understanding that law enforcement was there to support and help keep me safe. And that's why uh, I feel it's so important for leaders in law enforcement and our public safety officials to hear from the community who have had different experiences and have different perspectives. But it's not just enough to do that. We've asked for reforms and changes to training, policy approach, those types of things. One of the other right, things... I want to get Terry Boyd to because we're getting tight on time here. What can be done to increase diversity in the police department to better that relationship? Well, I think what you, what you need to do, you use that $100 million that the tax uh, increase uh, was targeted for, and you, you put together a strong recruitment effort uh, to bring mo more minority police into the, into the service, as well as specific type of training. You know, uh, you know we uh, recruit uh, other uh, uh, industries, uh, we, we recruit people to be trained in other industries, we can do it for the police department, we can do it for the fire department. Uh, we need to do that. But, but unfortunately, uh, you know, some of us don't realize what we already have, and we don't understand the, the experiences that people have. All right, we, all have right. a, we have a community relations commission that has strong powers. Not as much see, power as, as, as what he's asking for, but we'll, we'll have to leave it's, it there. It's even led by we'll, a police officer. We'll have, to, we'll have to leave it there. That ends this discussion, as brief <laughs> as it is. Uh, we urge you to uh, learn more. We'd like to thank the candidates for taking the time to uh, let us know where they stand on important issues in this primary. We'll continue to discuss the mayor's race here on Columbus on the Record, and the WOSU News team will offer in-depth coverage on 89.7 NPR News and WOSU.org. For our candidates, for our crew, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.